continuing with part two, jury trial, day five, premature strikes, four, motion hearing, Manitowoc County, motion hearing, Calumet County, case number 05, CF381, February 9, 2007. Cross-examination by Attorney Strang. And thank you, Mr. Austin. I just very briefly want to understand the total station a little bit better. When you say that device locates itself in space, is this through the assistance of Global Positioning Satellite? No, sir. May I try to re-explain? Sure, yes. If I can, when I set the total station up, if you take a point directly underneath that instrument, essentially, that's our, well, we call it a zero point. If you're to think back to, say, high school geometry, we have our x-axis and we have our y-axis. We also have our z-axis, which is our height. So that point directly below the instrument that we have created is zero, zero, zero. It will then take the angle and distance to you, sir, and then it will recognize your position, then both horizontally and vertically. Okay, and it does that by laser? Yes, sir. So it's sending a laser beam and then measuring the time back to a reflective surface or receptor on the total station. We have a, it's a two-man operation. If you will, sir, if the piece or item we were measuring it was over by you, or if you were standing by that, I would give you a prism, which is uh, on a staff, and you would hold that directly on that item or directly over it. And yes, it would reflect back from that prism. So what, what it's measuring then is not an item, but the prism that someone is holding or on or near the item you're trying to map. Correct. The total station knows, or we tell it how tall, tall it is by measuring it. We also tell it how tall the prism is so it is mathematically calculates to compensate for that height. So it is still, it's measuring to the prism. But what it is, is determining is a coordinate to, an, to the atom at the bottom of the staff. Okay. Uh, by Tony Strain. And I may need to have that kind of assistance of Mr. Kratz. May I call on that? Attorney Kratz, please. Attorney Strain, if we, for example, if we went to something with a four burn barrels behind Barb John's trailer. Attorney Kratz. Give me the figure, uh, figure number, Mr. Strain. Attorney Strain, I don't have the, I don't have the foggiest. The witness, Mr. Kratz, can we look at figure 30, uh, 23? Attorney Kratz, you certainly can. The witness, it's on page 24. Would that work, sir? Attorney Strain, beautiful, just fine. By Attorney Strain. The barrels themselves, as they are modeled here, look like they are supposed to have holes in them. Is that, is that right? I applied, uh, I applied a rust-colored texture to them. I don't believe it is supposed to depict holes. It is supposed to depict just a rust color. Just something you picked off the digital palette uh, that the program provides. There's a library, if you will, uh, that's, oh, that's with it. And I did pick a rust color to give the impression that it's a rusty barrel. Okay, I thought we were having a, our virtual fly, uh, flyer one that saw dark spots, and I took it to be holes in the barrel. Maybe, maybe it was my imagination of what the image was supposed to be. If there were dark spots on there, and, and I think I do believe there are, it's, it's designed just to, just to show an old barrel, not, des, not designed to show any type of hole. So, one who is looking at this end says, Boy, gee, looks like there's lots of holes in those burn barrels. Is something is seeing something that's simply supplied by your imagination or the computer's choice of replication of a background or a color that you have selected? For the barrel, uh, could someone get that impression from what you're seeing you are telling me? Yes. Okay, and I'm not trying to tell you, I'm just asking you. I mean, if we if it looks like a hole, that doesn't mean there was a hole in the barrel. Right. You said you got that impression, so obviously somebody could, yes. Or I could have serious mental problems, I suppose. Uh, but setting that aside, if it looks like a hole, that doesn't mean there's a hole there. 
In that case, again, that was a texture from the library designed to show, in fact, I believe it was for simply for a burn barrel that I utilized. Excuse me? The texture that I signed was from the library for a burn barrel. Oh, okay. And just, I'm just trying to get a better feel for the particularly interested in the three-dimensional process. You consistently use the term model to describe the images that you have created for the state. Why did you use the term model? That's the term that's mostly used in the industry, if you will. The software program I'm using is generally used in a in the jewelry or marine, but both design industries. And these are generally referred to as models. I could just, uh, I could just the same uh, refer them as three-dimensional uh, scale diagram. Perhaps it's just a term that's been instilled in me from when I received the training. Sure, but one thing that you mean by, to denote by den choosing the word model is that this is not a photograph in the sense that people have understood that term for at least the last 150, 160 years or so. That's correct. No, I would never try to st state this is a photograph of the scene. It's not. It's not a photographic depiction uh, of the sense of something that is accurate as a photograph might be. I don't know if I agree with you on, on accurate. The geometry here, everything is accurate. And I'm with you on that. I'm with you on the geometry and special relationships. Okay. You, you and I don't have to quarrel at all, at least for the, for now, about that. And I, and I don't know that we ever will. But in terms of details that a human eye might take in, a hole in the metal burn barrel, chipped paint on the side of a garage, graffiti on the side. I'm not suggesting there was graffiti, but graffiti on the side of the garage, a broken window pane, a lone leaf left on a tree. Those sorts of visual details here, the model doesn't even purport to capture. That's correct. No, you would see those in your crime scene photographs. So the, what the model is useful for, among other things, I guess, but primarily is showing us relationships in space of one item to another, for example. True? Yes. Okay, and does the model or does the total station, which you eventually download uh, to the Forensic 3D software, does the total station do a good job, for example, of capturing the circumference of the opening on the top of a burn barrel? To map the location of the burn barrel, each particular one, what I would do is I would take the three points on there, and I can use those three points in the CAD software to create a perfect circle, if you will. So, you know, I don't actually go around on every um, half inch with the prism. Three points because that's what I need to create a circle. Okay, so if we look at the four burn barrels, what you have done with your partner uh, who's holding the prism for you on the stick is you have gone to three separate points on top of each one of these four burn barrels. Correct. There would be three points on each barrel for those four, for, for those four there. Okay, and then the computer says, I know what to do now. I will create a perfect circle. Well, I have to tell it to do that. You know, I will essentially, in the software, I have to, I've got various options, editing, drawing tools, etc. I will tell it, I'm going to draw a circle and I'm going to give you the three points. I then identify those three points and my circle is generated. Got it. So again, with the limitations here, if what we were, we were interested in knowing is, you know, how far from the side of the door to Bob Johns' trailer is in a cluster of the four burn barrels, this would be a very good tool for doing that, correct? If I wanted to, are you asking me if I wanted to physically measure the distance using the CAD environment or to get a perspective view? A perspective view. Then I get, then yes, I agree, this would be the tool. Okay, and indeed, I suppose you could just use the software to spit out the exact I'll spit out, but to tell you, if you're going to run a cord line from the middle of the four burn barrels to the doorknob on the side door of the trailer, we could we could get down uh, to a fraction of an inch a distance of that cord line, correct? Yes, we could. But as to the burn barrels actually look like to the human eye or would look like in a photograph, we shouldn't be relying on the model to give us. I agree. Now, if we go back Mr. Kratz's assistance to figure nine. Is that possible? Attorney Kratz, sure. 
Okay, now I'm going to be interested in figure 10 eventually, but on figure 9, I see what looks to me like rather dramatic shadows or of two lovely leafy trees casting across the bottom of half of, the, of that picture. Yes. Is that what it looks like? Yes. And the measurements here were taken between November 5 and November 12, 2005. Yes. Okay, if I have my directions about right, should I be alarmed by a catastrophic change in the, the planet Earth's orbit and tilt that I now have a strong sun, uh, strong sun shining out of the northwest in early, early November 2005 and the northern hemisphere? I can put this in particular item in perspective, and perhaps I should have done that uh, with Mr. Kratz. The, that, the page that is on, on page 14 of my report, is talking about the forensic 3D software package. And the image right before this one is the one of unrendered garage. And this one is shown in my report directly underneath. It is showing as a rendered version. And my point here, the point is in the report was to show how we can generate these models with the various textures on them. This is in no way, this is, this particular view is not, or with the shadows, is not shown any later in the report when I'm talking about the scene models. And these are actually not leafy trees. These are the pine trees that are put up near the residence that you are seeing. So would not try to purport that this shows how it looked on November 5th, 6th or 7th through the 12th, uh, 2005. This is, uh, was to show the software. So how do the lovely long shadows of the pine trees get in there? I turn the sun on this particular case to show again the software's capabilities. You will see in the other renderings the sun I actually have off. You will see some shadowing, but the sun directly, directionally has not been turned on. I did not intend to depict at any, t any time of day, specific time of day, in any of the models you are seeing, you know, that are designed to show you the actual scene or, uh, or any animation. Or to suggest the orientation of the sun, uh, of the sun to the scene. No, I did not do that. Or did I have any intention of doing that? Okay. And when we see the trees in your models, particularly the ones that are leafless, as they might be in early November around here, they all look the same to me. Are these simply trees that the computer generates for the purpose of suggesting that there, are, there is a tree in that spot in space? This software package allows me to actually specifically specify different types of trees to specify different seasons. You will see uh, your apple blossoms in the spring and apples in the summer. Uh, I suppose for the uh, purpose of demonstrative of the, there uh, being a tree, I did not vary the trees at all. So you're very correct, and all, and all of the leafless trees are the same. The only difference is in their size. Okay, and in general, then, there's a certain number, uh, amount of artistry, if you will, on your part or on the part of the operator turning the sun on or off, selecting the color palette, that kind of thing, to help make this an attractive model, if you will. The intent is not to be attractive, if you will. It's to show that there is a tree in this position, that this item is a barrel, but we do have some liberty, if you will, of picking what tree is going to go in there or what texture is going to be there, I suppose. Uh, I do the best I can to try to make that as close as possible. Uh, no, and please don't make, take this as intact. And by attractive, I understand you're not planning to send this home to mom so it can be put in the refrigerator. This is designed to give us uh, a sense of reality or the illusion of reality of a real scene, correct? The design is to give you an idea. And I mentioned these buzzwords before about geomet geometric perspective and spatial relationships. Right. But to give you uh, to give a, a, you an idea of how that scene is laid out, it's not, as you mentioned before, it is not designed to give you a photograph or a photographic image of what that scene looks like. So whether to color the garage or what color to make it or whether to turn to turn on the sun or to uh, leave the sun turned off, you know, which direction the shadows should fall, whether it should be shadows, how to color the gravel. These are all the just decisions you have to make in good faith. 
I'm not suggesting anything to the contrary, but these are just artistic decisions uh, for want of a better word in presenting something that looks like other than just shades of gray. Yes, those are the decisions that I make. Okay. And then there's, you know, you don't have to buy into uh, the, uh, the label artistic. Uh, I don't mean anything by it. Uh, I don't mean to pick a fight by that. But in addition to those kinds of decisions you made in creating your exhibits here, there are also some decisions that were made by either Mr. Kratz or by Mr. Weigert or Mr. Fassbender, primarily, correct? Uh, as to the colors that were used? No, no. The uh, other decisions as to the depictions, specifically, what items would be included? Oh, yes. Okay. And those decisions simply were made by an advo advocate or people on this one side of this lawsuit for demonstrative purposes. Uh, can you say that one more time? I did not understand the lawsuit part. Sure. Some of the decisions about what to include simply were made by either Mr. Kratz as a one of the lawyers for the state or one of the two lead investigators on the case or the purposes of showing or demonstrating what they would like to show or demonstrate. Yes, that's correct. Okay, now I'm quite certain, knowing these gentlemen somewhat, that they didn't ask you to include anything that was made up, made up out of uh, Falk House. Uh, and you were also on the scene, correct? Yes. So did you satisfy yourself that the things that you were asked to include, in fact, were things present at least uh, sometime between November 5 and November 12th? If I understand your question correctly, you were asking if I'm satisfied everything we have depicted was at the scene during that time. Yes. Yes. Okay. Nothing was added in. In other words, if we if we go to figure 41, again, with Mr. Kratz's help, or via the garage, sir? Yes. Yes, with the roof peeled off. So if we go to that, there, in fact, was, looks like a John Deere lawnmower or tractor present in the scene uh, at some point while you were there. Yes, sir. There were two snowmobiles each uh, a flank of the Suzuki Samurai, not just one. Yes. Okay, but now go to the other direction, or the converse of this. There was also some items present that have been omitted from those mo these models, correct? Yes, omitted or not measured. There was a lot of debris, for the lack of a better word, in, the gar in that garage. Okay, so while it... We haven't added anything in that wasn't there. We have taken out some things that weren't there, that were there. Taken out or they weren't measured uh, when I was there. And if they weren't measured, they cannot be included. If they weren't measured, then you're not going to see them in there, denoted as being in a specific location. So someone looking at this figure 41, for example, unless he or she was able to look at a photograph taken at or about the same time, you would not understand uh, that garage, in fact, contained a whole lot more items and cluttered than it appears to be in the, appears to in the model. I believe I understand your question. Like if we were to look at the, uh, there's a table back here denoted in a silver or grayish color. There are items on that table, if you will. There were, uh, I can tell you what they are, parts or boxes or other items. No, I denoted the location of that table, but not everything that was on it. Right. In fact, your recollection recollection is that the tabletop was all but covered with junk and miscellaneous things. Yes. Okay. Likewise, the garage floor uh, was not covered, but quite cluttered with all kinds of parts and miscellaneous stuff. There were more item, items in that garage than what were depicted in this particular perspective. Uh, perhaps the most striking example of this, if you were went to figure 31, the residence over the, over here? Yes. Attorney String, is your honor able to follow along? The court. Yes, I'm following along. I have hard copies of the exhibits, and I'm looking at them. Okay. Attorney Kress, do you need uh, something from me? Attorney String, figure 31 would be great just for the spectators. Attorney Kress, with or without arrows. Uh, Attorney String, uh, right now, either is okay. Very well. 
If the uninitiated took the model uh, in figure 31 as an entirely accurate representation of the way that Mr. Avery's home looked, one would conclude that at least as to his living room and dining room, uh, he had a fairly minimalist philosophy of interior design. In fact, I documented uh, that in my narrative too, sir, uh, that the items in those rooms were not measured, you know, what the furniture was, was in there. Yes, without. If they weren't shown a crime scene photo or they weren't told that this is designed just to show the relationships of certain objects, yeah, they would not probably have an understanding that there were other items there. Things like couches and chairs and fairly large pieces of furniture. I remember two chairs. I don't remember having a couch. Okay, but in other words, there were uh, there's some significant pieces of furniture that just aren't there. They just aren't here. That's correct. Okay, and so the things that are included reflect some editorial judgment on the part of the state in this instance. Or items that I, like I say, I didn't actually get to the chairs that you're referring to there by the time our, our war ran out that day. So yeah, there's also some judgment on my part uh, when I was there uh, as to what items I could get into in the time allotted. Fair enough, fair enough. And throughout making the slides in a number of ways, you were guided uh, by the request of, let's just say, agents of the state in directing you on which of the available island items that actually were, uh, were there should be included and which should be omitted from the image or, or the model? Yes, that's correct. Now, in explaining that such direction is common in your work, you told the court that this is common to rely on one side or the other in the lawsuit for that sort of, uh, of direction. The bulk of the work that I do, as, as Mr. Crafts pointed out, is in crash uh, reconstruction. Yes. And a lot of the diagrams that I do for crash reconstruction we don't show everything in those uh, aspects either. We actually usually collect more information than we need. Or the uh, flip side, we can't show every single crack that's in the pavement. So that's why what I meant by it's uh, relatively common to only show certain aspects for certain things to be omitted. You know, I'm never going to intentionally omit something of evidence or value for either side, but I think it would be impossible to show everything. Uh, that, and that's not where I'm going. What I'm saying is that you are getting your direction from one side. Yes, not from two sides. That's correct. And because you're employed by the Wisconsin State Patrol, uh, when would the defense uh, ever be, in a criminal case, the defense ever be suggesting what should be included and what not included in a model? Typically, that has not happened. I did offer to you, Mr. Kratz, you know, that we could do add an additional items if there was something that you particularly wanted displayed or shown in there. I haven't heard anything back on that yet, but no, typically we don't call a defense attorney up and say, uh, what do you want in the diagram? Or, you know, I guess I haven't had a chance where they have approached me and uh, said, you can add this. I've been asked in court uh, to draw in where something was in a, in a diagram, on a diagram, but no, not the scenario that you're portraying. That's not happened to me. Uh, it's the first I'm hearing of it too. And you know, uh, they are entitled to create their own demonstrative exhibits. They're just, uh, they just are just the same way I am. The point is you are someone at the uh, Technical Reconstruction Unit of the Wisconsin State Patrol Academy and more typically would assist in the prosecution in preparing such exhibits. That's correct. And that's how it was in this case, uh, as you point out, yes. Here we can uh, use this just as well as anything. The, the items that are shown, all of them were mapped with a forensic station or the total station. Uh, no, a lot of these items were manually, the measurements were manually recorded. It would be possible, but very difficult, to set, uh, set the instrument up in a small bedroom, as you will, that we had here in the residence. Uh, it was just quicker to manually, if you will, measure their positions. Fair enough, fair enough. And those measurements may have been taken at different times by different people. No, I took the measurements that uh, you are seeing here uh, were taken by me on the last date. Uh, so obviously, they're going to be uh, at different times, but I was there 
at one, you know, all at one time frame, if you will. Okay, and again, now I'm just using demonstratively to speak. Okay, so so don't get carried away with just an image of, but in general, these images have we have seen the mapping. Uh, whether done by total station or done manually was done at different times. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. Yes, they were all done, you know, in the course of one day. Uh, then we would call the day or go home, come back the following day, reset up, reset up or do a different area or finish that location. And during that time you were on scene doing the mapping, there were 50 to 100 other law enforcement officers also on scene executing at least a couple of search warrants uh, you were aware of. Yes, they were never in the immediate area we were working in. It's a very large area, obviously. Right. A lot of rec a lot of searchers were down in the, where the vehicles were in the salvage yard. But yeah, I do know, for example, that there were probably 60 of my co-workers that were out there doing searches. Okay, and do you have any, uh, no way, and you have no way of knowing what items of law enforcement officers may have moved before you got around to mapping uh, the dimensions and location of those items. If that happened, I wouldn't know. I would like to go uh, briefly to the skeletal model, just an unlabeled uh, image. There we go. Great. That works fine. This uh, thing actually came off of a CD that the FBI sent you. Yeah, I contacted there uh, was their structural imaging unit. I would have to look uh, at the particulars and requested a structural design unit of the FBI and requested a skeletal model in the standard CAD, but in a drafting format. That's what, and that's, they sent me what's called an a DXF file, which means drawing exchange file that my software could also read. So yes, I did obtain these files from the FBI. Okay, and, and was the, the depiction uh, on the FBI's CD or DVD, whatever it was, a photograph, or was that image itself a computer-generated image of some kind? Uh, what they gave me was, you know, for lack of a better term, we discussed it before, was a three-dimensional model. It was actually the CAD file, if you will, would have been similar to my final overall scene of the Avery property. This is just a file, if you will, of a female skeleton, which I can move around in 3D space. Sure or put textures to the or label uh, label accordingly. So it wasn't the picture they gave me, uh, it was the actual model itself. Again, computer generated. Yeah, a computer electronic file, yes. Yes, and as, as to whether it was a female skeleton, you simply, uh, you relied on the label to assign to the file. I trusted the FBI and I trusted Dr. Eisenberg to confirm, yes, this is a female. Okay. And if you know, do we have a height on the skeletal model, on the model itself? Yes. I think, I think it might it, it, it right around five feet. I would have to go back and look, sir. But in any event, there's a number that you could give us or dimension that you give us as a, as height of the skeleton. Yes. Yes. I could go back and see what that was. Although everything, if I were to adjust that model's height, everything would be proportionate, meaning if I made it five feet tall or if I made it 20 feet tall, the relative size and proportion would remain the same. Okay, so this can't uh, be taken to depict any particular person, in other words. No, that's not my intention here at all. It was to help Dr. Eisenberg to point out specific bone locations. Right, the knee bone connects to the shin bone and one can see where the knee bone would be in relationship to the shin bone? Yes. Okay, that's fine. So let me go to uh, some specific questions. And here it will be useful, not so much to use the screen, but just the binder that we have here. We have all the same one. Okay. Now we have been describing three dimensional models, but of course none of them are, uh, are uh, right. We're looking at flat pieces of Two, two dimension paper or flat images on a screen. Yes, it's a flat screen. The illusion of a third dimension is a perspective provided by the mathematical algorithm. Yes. The design of the software itself or the design of the algorithms that create the illusion of the three dimensional space are not something that you, uh, that are your work product. That's correct. 
of something in which you are an expert. No, I'm not a programmer. So this is this is this is a commercially available or proprietary software package that somebody in the Wisconsin State Patrol Academy purchased and you use. The first part of your question is correct. The Wisconsin State Patrol Academy did not purchase this. This is something that as a trainer of the software that I have that I have from them. So this is, is not something that State Patrol has purchased yet. Sure, okay. And that will teach me uh, to a uh, ask compound questions. If we go to figure uh, 17, the exterior of the trailer, sir, or of the residence, rather. Yes, that looks to me like that looks like that to me. Uh, you have no idea what, if anything, a duct, ta a duct tape may have to do with duct tape under the porch may have to do with anything in this case, do you? No. Attorney Strain, do we have a labeled version of that? Attorney Kratz, sure. Okay, but somebody uh, asked you to include some duct tape. Yes, that's correct. And this figure, and you didn't give, uh, didn't give you exactly where the duct tape was supposed to be. No, that's based off of a photograph. So quite honestly, you simply tell us uh, here that you're doing an approximation. Yes. Again, whether the duct tape have, has anything to do with anything, you have no idea. That's correct. Okay, likewise, in figure 18, you re refer to a number of items, a vehicle bench seat, a mallet, tire cores, a rake, and here again, you tell us placement is to, is to be deemed as approximate, correct? Yes, sir. So this is something that you just decided where to put these items in the model. I tried to do the best I could to explain in the narrative here as best that, as to how the items were placed. The one you pointed out here, yeah, they had been moved before I forensically mapped that location. I relied on photographs taken by the State Patrol Trooper Jim Reese to put those items in a place in place. So I did what I could to note which items were mapped and which were based on photographic evidence. But we could look at the photographs if uh, he wanted if he wanted to know where the items were, which I did in this case. But now our view here, we've moved up to, I don't know what our uh, elevation is here. Looks like somewhere around 50 feet looking down so we can uh, see the entire area. So if we wanted to pretend that we were 55 feet tall, uh, now we can do that. I don't think that's the intention would be uh, for play acting, just a good, just to get a good overview. Right, but that's the point of the view, so to speak. Yes. Okay. The court, excuse me, Mr. Strain, let me just ask just one question. The approximate location based off the photos, is that a number of photos or one photo that showed all these items? The witness. There are several photos I was able to utilize. I can't tell you, Your Honor, how many I, uh, many I had at that point. Trooper Reese did, did take several shots behind there with the camera. And for those, for some of these, uh, if it was possible, I also utilized aerial photographs so that we can see the vehicle bench seat in uh, one of those. But if I could use, the more I could use, obviously the better. The court, go ahead, Mr. String. Uh, there are a number of, uh, number of area uh, photo, uh, photographs taken, some of which you used to assist you. Yes. Were any of those done with the zoom lens? I would, I would have to look at my notes to see what Trooper McConnell did or what camera, uh, type of camera uh, he had or a focal lens. I guess I don't uh, know because I wasn't involved in those. And that's not worth the time. Did you look at them digitally? Yes. Okay, so we know that they were digital photographs at least. Yes. And therefore, we could use photographs or something on the computer to enlarge or minimize the view on part, part of those photographs. That is correct. There's also some non-digital pictures that I believe were arranged in, to be taken by DCI, which showed items also. Uh, those were not digital, but you could look at, those, uh, look at them and see. Okay, if you go to figure 32, Attorney Kratz, labeled? Attorney Strang, either way. Uh, this is the bathroom. Yes. 
Okay, there's a bathroom door, but it looks like the doorway has disappeared. Uh, the material on, uh, I'm going to use the letter pointer here, sir. Sure. The material on this wall is the same as the material on this wall. Uh, and as you see, this is a shadow from the wall coming down. It's going to be in the rendering or perhaps how we're displayed uh, here was printed. There is an opening here, but because the walls behind it is a, it is identical in texture, it gives us uh, the illusion, if you will, in that picture that it's a solid wall. Uh, but we do see a shadow from this uh, back wall here in here, which shows us that there really is an opening here, opening there. Uh, if I would have made this wall darker or this wall darker, you would see the difference. I would see a doorway. Yes. You see what I mean about the shadow that's back there? The shadow's actually on that hallway wall. So that's why we're seeing it inside by looking through the door. Okay. So it's not a situation where there was an error of measurement or something that caused the computer to think there was no doorway into the bathroom. No, it's in fact that I have the same texture on that, that wall as I do on the other wall. And in that, this particular render gives us, uh, gives us that. I don't want to say it's an optical, optical illusion for lack of a better term, it appears to us that the door is missing. Here again, this is an, another example where uh, you quite forthrightly uh, in the report told us that you were approximating the location of the guns. That's correct. And you're right that it is mentioned in the report. If we go to figure 36A now, you may, uh, you may not know enough about this case to understand this, but this sort of model is something that uh, the lawyers have probably uh, spending a fair amount of time looking at. And I have seen photographs depicting the same area. So just for the court's benefit, there are very noticeably a pair of men's slippers just to the left of the key in this photograph, in the photographs of the same area you have modeled here. Have you seen these photographs uh, too? Yes, I was given a singular photograph in this case to show me the location of that key and I was asked to put the, that key in. I'm aware of the slippers that you, uh, they are talking about. And the outlet on the wall? That's correct. Okay, so is this the kind of thing that you are simply told, don't bother about the outlet on the wall, don't bother about the slippers, you show the, uh, the approximate uh, location of the key? I was asked about the outlet on the wall uh, by the prosecution and that one I would have had difficulty putting in without having measurements. Uh, I did not measure the outlets or the light switches when I was there. I felt comfortable putting the key on the carpeting on the floor, but I did not feel comfortable in putting in the outlet in. An earlier draft of this, uh, and I understand it was just a draft, had no key fob on the key correct. That's correct. No little blue purple strap blue or purple strap where you asked to add that uh, back in that didn't exist at one point at that point in the previous draft, I believe you're referring to the one I delivered to you back in December that was um, in there as a generic key if you will it was not the actual key or model of the key uh, that was found after that version came out I was asked to put in if you will the actual key so I was given access to it I took measurements, measurements of that key and hence you see this, uh, see it in this particular version. Okay, and as we go through, we don't need to stop uh, particularly on each of these, but figures 37 and 38, you've got cross-batched uh, area, cross-hatched areas to show approximate locations of things. Is that again based on photographs or just somebody's description to you that were bleach or duct tape was found? Yes and yes, there were photographs of both of these items. In fact, looking at my photographs that I took when I was at the residence, uh, the bleach you're referring to in figure 37 was in place. But yes, those were based on requests the they be in and or based on statements and photographs. Go to figure 44 if you would. Yes. Now here, some color has been added for the highlighting, specifically blue color, correct? You're referring to the truss. I apologize. My version uh, is black and white. Do you have the? Do you have your little? Uh, your writing at the top. Your captioning. Yes, you're referring to the 
to the mark. I can see it in one of uh, one uh, Mr. Kratz put up. Yeah, I thought that was uh, a blood print. Now, the blue coloring is something that added by you. Yes. Just to highlight an area. Yes. I believe, as I wrote here, it was shaded blue to make the area differ from the remainder of the other sections of the trusses. I did that to show location. The location is where we at least see some. someone told you uh, there were some marks on a ceiling truss. I actually, when we surveyed this part, we did use the total station for and myself and the other officers involved. So those marks ourselves. So that actual location is correct uh, on these. As uh, to they, do they have any value? I don't know. But we mapped out that location and we put, I put them in there. What are the marks and cells that you have highlighted? Have anything to do with anything? You have no idea? That's correct, sir. The next slide, figure 45, are we using in figure 45, the scene as it looked uh, in March 2006, uh, or the scene as it looked in November 2005, as a starting point for the model? The original model, and if I'm not, and I'm, if I'm not following you, please, please stop me. Oh, sure. The original model that's here is based on the forensic mapping that I did back in November of 2005. Now, what my intention to depict here is the items that were denoted by investigators in March of 2006. Apparently they had gone back in and found some items of evidentiary value. And that's what this and the following photographs are designed to, excuse me, I mean photographed image are designed to, 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 to depict is items that they noted during that examination. But the items themselves were among those that were mapped in November 2005 or were they simply added in based on the new information in March 2006? The paint thinner, I think, uh, as I talked about before, I didn't map the items that were on top uh, of the, that particular bench. I did observe after reading the reports and looking back at my photographs that I took uh, when the, while I was in the garage, the paint thinner was in place. I can't tell you exactly, say it's three inches over, four inches back, I can't do that. Sure. That's why it says approximate. Was the blackjack creeper? The blackjack creeper was in place when I was there. And at one point, and, and, and that one I could put in place uh, on the items around it. It's right up against uh, that air compressor and by the welder. So I had no difficulty in putting that in. Although you had not mapped it. No, the location of the blackjack creeper was not noted. However, the uh, compressor behind it there were, there's a lawnmower in front of it, a waste paper basket, a welder right there. So that was, I was very confident in putting that in place. All right, very briefly, we don't even, I don't even think we need images because they don't have figure numbers, but there are some close-ups of views of skeletal models showing defects, uh, what you have described as defects, uh, or probably Dr. Eisenberg described as defects in the mental uh, forearm and the parietal bone. True? Yes, sir. And on those you simply picked, or Dr. Eisenberg has picked at random, which side uh, of the head uh, he uh, to use as a modeling in those defects. I believe that, I guess, uh, I don't feel comfortable discussing that. I was directed that it's the left side of the head at this particular location of the parietal bone. Again, as Mr. Kratz pointed out, that's well outside my area of expertise. I generated those models under her supervision for Dr. Eisenberg. Okay, I'm interested in the text in them. I guess uh, just to nail that down on page 56. I'm there, sir. You write in part, however, it is unknown from which side of the mandible the fragment originated. For demonstrated purposes only, the model shown below depicts the left side uh, of the head. Uh, Attorney Crash, Judge, I'm sorry, the mandible is the jaw. Attorney String, right, yes, it is. Attorney Kratz, Dr. Eisenberg will testify exactly where the defect is on the cranial defect, but other than that, Your Honor, the text is what it is. The court, I must have a different page 56 because my page 56 doesn't show a jaw. I'm sorry, Mr. String, could you repeat the question? 
Well, the question was, am I right in, uh, that simply for purposes of illustration here, what you are saying at least is you're using the left side of the mandible. I believe, and thank you for refreshing my memory on this one, what I did in this case that I showed one of the metal forearm, which again, um, well outside my area of expertise, my understanding is it's an opening for a blood vessel in the jaw. There's a uh, there's blood on each side of the jaw. I depicted one of them. Uh, I believe the text says after that uh, that the mental forearm on the right side of the jaw is similarly located. Very well. Technically, that if you were uh, if you were asked, would it be possible to start with you know figure thirty one for example, and then add in uh, one arrow or label at a time like a PowerPoint presentation to use something much simpler uh, which uh, with which I'm familiar with. You're asking uh, that could be done? Yes, could that be done technically? Oh yes, without an unreasonable amount of work? No, it would not be unreasonable at all. Okay, what you have given us here uh, uh, are all the, all nothing, all the labels or none of the labels on the figures that for which can uh, we choose label or unlabeled? Yes, what I did uh, was I gave, obviously I couldn't do that in the report. Essentially, as you said, it's all or nothing here. Right. What I gave Mr. Kratz was four by six prints and electronic versions of either. Yes, all or nothing. But no, it would not be difficult amount of work to separate those out or to put those into a PowerPoint presentation. There's nothing magic about PowerPoint, but my point my point simply was, if some of the labels were acceptable to the court or the parties and not others, is that something you could do uh, with a great deal of trouble? If that were the decision, either you or Mr. Kratz were to direct me as to what has to be done, yes, we could make that happen. Okay, and similarly, no big deal to take out the words and some of those labels if that was the decision. So in other words, it could be uh, garage rather than Stephen Avery's garage, just for example. That's correct. And just go off a step further, if I may, sir. Sure. In the animation, that would be relatively easy also. Okay. The difficulty would be if we had to re-render some, some of those approaches. That would take a lengthy amount of time. But the textural parts in there can be altered rather simply. All right. And I think my last question is, the new DVD that I was just given this afternoon, or do you think that without any purchase of proprietary software, I could pop that into my laptop and run the virtual tour or stop it or that sort of uh, use of this exhibit as well? Yes, there's nothing proprietary about it. It's, just, uh, it's written as an uh, MPEG-2 format, meaning any DVD player can read that. Okay. And that could be stopped or backed up, uh, that kind of thing, by a person running the laptop? Yes, just as if you were going to put a regular movie in there. You could pause it, reverse it, or fast forward. Attorney String, thanks. That's all I have. Attorney Kratz, nothing for this hearing, Judge. The court, all right. Your witness is excused. We'll take our break at this time and give the reporter a rest. Come back in 15 minutes. Attorney Kratz, Judge, on this issue, we don't anticipate any more testimony. Uh, uh, do you want a brief argument? The court, I will hear argument after we get back. Attorney Kratz, what time do you want us back? The court, 15 minutes, quarter to four. Recess taken. The court, at this time, we're back on the record. I will hear arguments on the defendant's motion regarding the animations. I think Mr. String will get. Uh, will let you go first. I'm sure you know exactly what the objections are. Attorney String, sure. I think we can narrow the scope considerably. In the end, I don't think there will be any real problems at all with the skeletal model, and I work and I can work with Mr. Kratz or his colleagues on any money issues that re that remain. But I think, I think we're uh, heading on. That is that they have already removed color highlights on bones, which is good, which was good. And we're probably heading towards unlabeled images first 
and then adding labels as witnesses uh, as a witness describes you know whatever it is in the arrow uh, would come in for and I don't think that editorial uh, comment content of the labels on the skeletal models would be of any use at all uh, they are just really using formal names for bones so I think uh, that will wash out uh, I will talk a little bit about the proportion and you know get a better understanding of uh, of that how uh, now that I have a foundation from Trooper Austin on that but I don't expect that the court will need uh, to address uh, that and we will probably would withdraw the motion so far as the skeletal models go uh, or model every property you know this is northwest corner uh, of the 40 acre parcel that will present some difficulty perhaps and just to describe uh, what it is for the court I don't have a good vocabulary for this because at least to me uh, not being involved in you know uh, air crash uh, cases or personal injury cases where a great deal of money is at stake or com uh, computer generated animations are new to me even though they are not new to the profession particularly but the concern if I can articulate it is that the models come so close to a realistic or photographic quality that it's easy to forget that they are just not just are not the photographic eye the video camera picks up everything within its field of focus and there's no opportunity for somebody to say well I want this flower pot in but the watering uh, can go over here I want that taken out now obviously with digital photographs we actually can do that kind of thing now but the traditional sense a video recording or a photograph gives a true depiction these do not but what's included is so deceptively good and I don't mean uh, in a perjuratory sense perceptibly but it's so realistic appearing that it's easy I think for a juror to forget that he or she is looking at a collection of pixels that reflects editorial judgment on everything other than the geometry and I will simply take the geometry uh, and its spatial relationships off the table here I'm not concerned about the accuracy of the algorithm I'm not concerned about the accuracy of the measurements whether they are manual or done with a total station device that can be developed easily enough and understood by way of foundational questions uh, on direct or a few simple questions on cross-examination and jurors then can understand that well you know there may be some slight human error in the spatial relationships not worried about that or the geometry uh, if the court will where I get worried is things like uh, holes and burn barrels that kind of thing it is very easy to assume that there really must be a hole in the burn barrel if it looks like there's a hole in the burn barrel or easy to assume that you know the dog was standing out at the end of, the le of his leash if he's standing out the end of his leash and the depiction uh, here it's all much easier to lose track of the fact that we're not depicting anything as it would have been necessarily on October 31st 2005 we just there's no way of knowing these latter creations based on uh, later judgments we'll have to work on uh, some of the labeling but my expectation would be that collaboratively the state and the defense could come to some agreement on labeling as to the trailer and the genre trailer and the surrounding yard for what of one of a better word we may even get we may we're not yet today but we may uh, get to some agreement on something like the image that has a rake and a, and a tire cords and a mallet and a number of uh, items shown in their approximate locations it may be that if we're if the state introduces photographs during the same week that photo photographically show the scene it may be that I'm a lot less concerned about a demonstrated representation once the jury understands here are the photographs and here is the diagram which you know which is really intended just for the argument or illustration and not for pictographic accuracy we're not there yet we'll be able to get uh, get there on uh, that topic the greatest concern and the one which we probably do need the court's help is the garage the garage as depicted in the models here really is materially different than the garage was in real life and I say to myself here this is where the differences differences are so material that you know an actual jury view of that garage would be better than a virtual tour of the garage and the problem may be exasperated by the fact that 
for whatever reason, at least the photographs that Mr. Buting and I have seen of the garage aren't particularly good. They are not particularly numerous. So I don't know here uh, that there may be photographs I have not seen. Now, not that they haven't been given to me, but just that there's such a mass of photographs. I'm not sure I've looked at every photograph we have. But it may be that there are photographs I've not seen or things that could be blown up that would uh, allow the jury to see the garage as it actually was. Because the differences uh, are material and they may, mater may be material to arguments that the state wants to take. They would potentially become misleading if one is relying on on the computer model only as the garage. Could something fit in the garage? Could something have been laid down in the garage? The truss marks are marked on the truss. I have no reason to think that the state will be able to show the relevance here at all, here at all of the marks on the truss. So to have an image that takes the roof off gives the juror a view of that, as a witness said, probably is not humanly possible to have. And then on top of it, the uh, highlights something that may have nothing at all, at all to do with anything. In fact, as far as I know, does does have nothing at all to do with anything relevant or probative here. It becomes unfair, so that that the garage really is where most of the points of contention lie. And whether we can get there with photographs that would allow the jury to take take them proper in fair context a demonstrative model of the garage, I don't know. And, you know, as I say, the trailer would be a much happier with just a video camera walkthrough, which may or may not have been done at the scene. I don't know. I think it would be more accurate, but there probably are enough photographs in the end, uh, or there may be enough photographs of the trailer that we can live with modeling as long as the court gives a good instruction on what a demonstrative model exhibit may be or may not be used for, for properly. The court, Mr. Kratz, Attorney Kratz, thank you, Judge. I appreciate Mr. Strang's concessions regarding the admissibility, and that's what this hearing is. It's not to decide the weight that a jury may give to these items, but simply whether or not they are admissible. Uh, we're left with, then, the standards of admissibility for demonstrative, per demonstrative evidence which is one of the simplest formulas for a court to apply in admissibility hearings. And it's simply whether it will assist the jury and whether the probative value may be outweighed by the countervailing factors, uh, the 904.03 analysis. Demonstrative evidence in of itself is certainly uh, admissible. As Mr. Olson testified, if a citizen can come down from a witness stand and draw an intersection on a chalkboard without one measurement, without it being at all to scale, and that's admissible, there shouldn't be any question uh, regarding admissibility of these kinds of images. That is, with an excess of 4,100 measurements and being, uh, being perfectly, not only the scale, but of geome geometric por uh, proportions. Here's a case, Judge, State versus Peterson, the 1998 decision in Wisconsin, just cite uh, it for just a second, at uh, 222, Wisconsin 2D, 449, which describes the thing that I'm talking about. Uh, that is, the determination of admissibility requires the court uh, consider the degree of accuracy in the recreation, and complexity, and duration of the demonstration, whether there is other available means of proving uh, the same facts and those risk factors that I talk about. That is the risk that may impact the fairness of the trial. Uh, this court uh, heard, has heard from Mr. Austin, and I think there's no question as to the accuracy of these images. And I also think there is no qu question that it will assist the, uh, the trial of fact. The only real objection that I can envision would be in the area uh, or the point where we talk about it being cumulative. That is, the state even recognizes that we do reach a tipping point that there may be time when too many demonstrative exhibits are all being offered. But to reach that level, Judge, we're talking about so far down the path of relevances and so many exhibits that we really aren't talking about a relevancy issue anymore. We're talking about the same exhibit being shown over and over. The state certainly doesn't intend to do that. That's why these, uh, these are state exhibits. That's why uh, these are animations rather than simulations. 
And let me just uh, parenthetically, Judge, describe for the court and argue that we aren't talking simulations, we're talking animations. We're simply, uh, we're simply representations of objects that are shown within them that includes animation. Simulations, Judge, are when a computer is asked to draw conclusions from the data. Those uh, are those are conclu- reconstructions and the like. That the, that isn't what we're talking about here. This court need not approach any analysis about the science that's involved, since that appears to be unconverted. And so, for this hearing, Judge, I am asking the court to rule on, on admissibility of the scene images, both interior and exterior, as being uh, of the accuracy contem- contemplated by a trial court. They will assist the trier of fact, and there is no risk of fairness problem. Mr. Strang is free to describe or supplement any of these animations or, or computer, excuse me, we're talking about computer images, uh, with photographs. We're not prohibiting the defense, nor have we ever, of the creation of their own diagrams or their own renderings. Uh, these are state exhibits, and the jury will certainly be told that. So we're asking the court, again, rule on admissibility of the both the interior and exterior property images. As far as the skeletal images, I appreciate, again, Mr. Strang's concession and withdraw all of his uh, objection. Dr. Eisenberg, I'm sure we'll talk about the, uh, the bones and all those uh, appear accurate representations. And then, finally, Judge, as to the uh, animations, that is moving images, uh, the 5,200 images that are placed side by side in lieu of instead of a jury view. I don't know what better way we could have created something to show the jury special relations, relationships, relationships of evidence to known and fixed objects. There's nothing that I believe that is unfair or prejudicial in what we have seen. And so we're not just opening for, uh, or opening statements, Your Honor. But when other witnesses may be asked to use these images, I will ask leave of the court to be allowed to do that. Let me also assure the court and Mr. Strang that I expect that we will have to deal with the relevancy and materiality issues, especially on things like the garage or trusses or the like. But as far as whether or not these images are admissible, uh, the unbalanced and exhibit, uh, exhibit four are all the images that we have been provided to the court. With, uh, with the testimony, which I would ask the court to adopt, uh, of Mr. Austin, we'll ask the court to accept those as demonstrative evidence in this case. That's all I have. The court. Mr. String. Attorney String. I'm in full agreement with Mr. Kraft that the animation presents no separate problem. That is, if the image is fair and not materially misleading and therefore potentially helpful to the jury and the ability to move or change the point of view in the image is not objectionable. And I disagree that there's no simulation involved here, uh, but there certainly is no dynamic simulation in the sense that we don't have a 747 taking off and the depiction of a catastrophic failure results in an explosion, for example. The simulation we do have is the removal of rooftops, which is a simulation. Now, that is, isn't so much of a problem as it is in things like highlighting parts of a trust or, you know, labeling things in an editorial and potentially misleading kind of way. So I don't know, although there is some simulation here, I don't know that it's a problem in and of itself. The real problem where this stops becoming helpful to the jury is where it tends to mislead a jury into believing that the scene looked very different than it actually looked. And it's primarily an issue of the garage which if it can't be offset by good photographs of the garage as actually was during the evening of November 5, I think that we do have something that's not helpful to the jury because it confuses or misleads the jury. And the uh, court either would have to exclude or be very careful about uh, both the cautionary instruction with it and any labeling. I would ask the court to exclude altogether any highlighting as really helpful, not helpful, and indeed, affirmatively unhelpful. The court. All right. The parties have both sided to the court, uh, to the case of State versus Peterson, uh, 1998 Court of Appeals case. And although that case deals with a videotape that was taken later, the court agrees that much of the rationale and explanation of the law in that case appears to apply here. 
The court in that case indicated that before videotape demonstration could be admitted, it would have to be demonstrated that it was conducted uh, under conditions reasonably similar to the conditions existing at the actual event. The same standard, I think, will apply here. That is, the animations or they reasonably similar to what appearance was at the scene of, uh, at the time. Uh, the case goes on to provide, even if the foundation is established, the trial court may, in its discretion, include the videotape demonstration upon finding that the probative value of the tape is outweighed by its prejudicial effect. As I understand the defense, that may be part of its argument with respect to the garage. At this point in time, the parties have asked for guidance, and I'm going to attempt to give some guidance. It's difficult. I'm not in a position to address the motion to the extent it asked me to specifically exclude something because I don't have enough, uh, enough foundation. For example, the garage. At this point, I don't know enough about the video evidence to know what the significance of the clutter in the garage is going to be. I would say at this point, based on the defense's concern, I would want to see a foundation from the state laid before that particular image would be allowed in. That's an image that shouldn't be used as part of an opening statement presentation. With respect to some of the other concerns expressed by the parties, for example, the concern that the jury might feel that the animation shows holes and burn barrels, there's further language in Peterson where the court says, if enough of the obviously important factors in the case are duplicated in the experiment, and if the failure to control other possible relevant variables, as explained, and the jury is aided, the court should let the evidence in. As I viewed that particular exhibit, I, was, I wasn't I was struck by the fact that it looks like there's holes in the burn barrel, but I agree from looking at it, it's perhaps that's possible conclusion the jury could come to. In the court's mind, that type of thing can be fairly uh, easily explained away by simply saying that the, that the type of detail is not attempted to be shown by this exhibit. In many cases, I suspect there's going to be photographs uh, that do provide more detail and can certainly help put any animation into perspective for the jury. With respect to the concerns about any labeling that's, that is disputed, it seems to me that's easily enough to address by requiring a witness to lay foundation before any labeling comes in, unless it is agreed by both by the parties in, ahead of time. It certainly wouldn't be unusual for a witness to get, uh, get a, uh, up to a blackboard at a trial and draw a diagram and say, here's where I found a key or wherever, whatever it was. As long as uh, there is a witness that testifies to the location of something like that, it seems to me that the computer-aided images can be useful, uh, be a useful means of showing the jury what it is the witness is testifying to. Something like the truss marks in the garage, which I have to confess at this point, I have no idea what the significance of them might be, uh, what that type of thing would require foundation before uh, at an exhibit showing pointing an arrow to the trust marks would be admissible. There would have to be a prior showing that there's a foundation that a witness found something uh, there all. And also the court would have to hear any objections as to relevance. I don't know what relevance marks on the trust might, might, have, might have. With respect to the exhibit showing the approximate locations, the labels would depend on, number one, the significance of a precise location. If there's a rake or a mallet uh, in a yard, whether it's one foot, one way, or the other, doesn't make a tremendous difference. Approximate location may well be enough. If it's a location, if its location is vital and its precise location cannot be determined, uh, that would be a different story. I'm not sure based on the evidence presented and what I know at this point that I can provide the parties with uh, much more guidance. It appears that the defense is willing to acknowledge the concept of the relevance of some of these computer exhibits and there's uh, objections only going to be raised to certain exhibits. That's all the guidance I can give the parties at this point. Attorney Strain, I can help a little bit more uh, too just to clean things up. Mr. Krantz, Mr. Kratz has some actual photographs uh, that he intends to use at, uh, as a PowerPoint slides in his opening, and the photographs are not objectable to the opening presentation. The court, okay. Obviously, the opening has to be addressed at this point because the opening comes before there's any evidence. Are there, is there a, a dispute as to any computer-generated exhibits 
that the state wishes to use in its opening that the defense objects to. Attorney Strain, I have seen them. I'm trying to remember if the garage is one of these slides, and I can't. I just don't remember. Attorney Kratz, there is one image, Judge, uh, of the interior of the garage. Let me... I had that offered uh, it because it is where uh, two bullet fragments were found. I can replace this and probably with a photo uh, with evidence uh, tent 9 and 23A. And until the foundation is reached, uh, if this will satisfy Mr. Strang and with the leave of the court, I will simply replace this with a photo. There's nothing special about this, uh, Judge, that I have to the court. Well, again, for further guidance of the parties, and I uh, have some reservations because at this point, Mr. String is indicating there may not be any photos that show what it really looked like. But if you have a had a photo that showed how cluttered the garage was, and it was followed immediately by an exhibit such as this, just to show the location of the evidence, the jury would have uh, have then both an idea, a clear idea from the exhibits, uh, for the evidence was found in a clear exhibit, an idea of the photo of exactly what the garage looked like, and I would probably admit both of them. Attorney Kratz, I tend to do that. And in fact, Judge, uh, you have this photo of the garage, and in fact, uh, my, in my opening, is it is intended to put the communi- uh, computer animation right after this uh, photo. This is a March 1st photo. Uh, does show the clutter, does show tent nine, does not show tent uh, number 23, which for the court's information, it would be, uh, or the second bullet. The court, is the defense satisfied that if the other exhibit immediately follows this one, that it's not objectionable? I'm assuming this is what the defense means by clutter. It would qualify as clutter in my book. Attorney Strain, yeah. Uh, And there was uh, a whole vehicle is missing here. Of course, this is in March. But, well, let me say this. I mean, I have no objection to the use of this photograph in the opening statement. This is something that's going to be admissible. And, indeed, we have stipulated the foundation of authenticity. Authenticity, I should say, of, I think, every photograph the state wants to offer. This would be relevant. The court. Well, for purposes of a ruling on the opening, I will, since I'm seeing both exhibits now, if this exhibit is part of the opening... And if the objection to the garage photo is that it doesn't accurately depict the amount of clutter in the garage, if the computer exhibit immediately follows this one, I think it's allowable. To me, the combination of the two adequately informs the jury of the relevant variables that uh, that have to be explained, and this photo certainly appears to explain those variables. Attorney Kratz. Very well. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Judge. Do I understand, then, that the balance of the images that have to be provided to both counsel and the court will be met with uh, without objection. The court, well, I think Mr. Strain objected to a series of labeling items, possibly. Uh, Attorney Kratz, uh, no for opening, Judge. Attorney Strain, no oh, for opening. Attorney Kratz, for my opening images, that's what we're talking about now, I thought. Attorney Strain, what other images? Attorney Kratz, there's one of, of the house, uh, this one, Attorney Strain, I don't think there was any problem with that image. Attorney Kratz, very well, thank you. The court, I will say this. If you are showing uh, that in the opening and there's a series of pieces of furniture that are missing, and I see this one appears to have more furniture than the other one I looked at, uh, but it would be helpful in the opening at least to make a mention to the jury of limits that apply to the animation since they will be seeing it at a time when they haven't received any evidence. Attorney Kratz, very well, thank you. That actually takes care of two of our motions today. The court, are there any other items related to the computer-generated animations that require addressing at this time? Attorney Kratz, I will, and I appreciate the court's direction and general statement as to the admissibility. I will continue to work with Mr. Strain, which will now next week, uh, when offered, I suspect that Trooper Austin will give a, uh, a version of, of what he did today and perhaps the non-objectionable, non-objectionable images can be shown. And then before and until those foundations are laid, we can address those more objectionable images as the trial unfolds. 
that seemed to be the most reasonable approach. But once again, I will discuss that with Mr. Strain. The court. All right. There is one other issue on the agenda today, and that was the original instruction with the preliminary instructions to be given to the jury prior to trial. I provided to the parties, obviously, with the draft of the instructions the court was proposing to give. The statute that covers this provides that if the court gives additional instruction uh, beyond the one specified in the, in the statute, they, sh uh, they shall be disclosed to the parties before they are given. Another party may object to any specific instruction or proceed proposed instructions of its own to be given prior to trial. It's my understanding at least the defense had instructions it wished to submit. I don't know about the state. But given the hour and the fact that I'm not sure what the parties will be doing uh, this weekend, uh, but I know I will be in my office, let me suggest this. If either party wishes to object, either object to the instructions I have included or propose additional instructions that it, re that it requests be given, you can put those in a Word document and email them to me. I will get them this weekend, and on Sunday I will email you back uh, the proposed uh, opening instructions that I will give after consideration of any suggestions from either party. Will that work? Attorney Gon, I have just one quick one that I think would solve all of it if we could do it. Uh, if you want to just hear about it, one thing that I have proposed uh, through it under uh, the 110, under your first degree intentional homicide, when you have elements of the crime, I think that it states here that before the jury can find the defendant guilty, so the defendant or Brendan Dassey, I think that's troublesome because I think we need to cross out Brendan Dassey. We have to focus on because the jury could find Brenda Dassey committed this and by reading this could also find Stephen Avery guilty. The court. Well, that's just what this just wait a minute. The state is uh, the party charging the party to a crime here. And I believe that granted you wouldn't get a reading from just the sentence alone. What you were asking for, but if you move on to the jury's instruction portion, you would have to find that to be more satisfied by a reasonable court and that the defendant committed both elements of the crime or that he intentionally aided and abetted. If you're going to the party to the crime theory, the first element is that someone else, in this case, Mr. Dassey, committed the crime. And then you have to go on to find that Mr. Avery aided and abetted. I think that's taken from, uh, taken from the form instruction. Attorney gone. I read it as if, if they were to find Mr. Dassey committed the offense, that they could find the defendant. I just think it would be clearer if we left the name out of Brendan Dassey and just said the defendant, comma, uh, and either do one of four things, either put as a party to a crime or put as a principal or as an aider and a better or put as a person concerned uh, with the commission of a crime or fourth as a person who was a party. I've seen it all done in all four different or in concert with another and leave the name Brenda Dassey out. I wonder what Mr. Strain thinks of that because I don't think it's beneficial to Mr. Avery. The court. Well, Mr. Strain, Attorney Strain, I do have my own objections to it from a different angle, and I like I like the court's idea of putting this in a writing. And if I think the word comes as part of the Windows Office Suite, so it's probably on this box somewhere, I always use word perfect. The court. I think even if you send it in word perfect, I could open it. Attorney Strain. In other words, the court does not want uh, want it in PDF because uh, would require retapping. The court. Right. Attorney Strain. Okay. The court. Yes. Attorney Strain. Let me figure. I will try. I will try to figure out how to get into Word and address it. But, uh, but as to, uh, to a preview, I think the court has created duplicity. A duplicity problem by by joining together the first degree intentional homicide and the mutilation of a corpse counts. And I too have some concerns about the way Brendan Dassey is added uh, to the substantive elements under 1010. Although I mean Brendan Dassey is the person as to whom Stephen Avery is supposed to be a party to the crime. I mean that's clearly the state's uh, theory. So I don't know that Mr. Dassey ought to come out altogether. The court, if both, if both parties prefer 
to, I joined them because they are both charged as a party to the crime. If both parties uh, want completely separate instructions for each one, I will honor that request. Attorney Strain, let me work on it. We'll obviously copy each other on any emails. What I can do, the court has a note. The pages aren't numbered, but the court asked, does the defense wish that I notify the jury of an agreement that Mr. Avery had an unreversed felony conviction on, a, uh, on the felon in possession of a charge? Uh, the court, yes. Attorney String, and I do. I think we ought to just uh, be uh, upfront with the jury about that. The court, okay. I don't know. That's. I think I have been informed that it was the intention of the parties to place that on the record, but I don't know that it's been done yet. Attorney String, my intention is to stipulate away the second element of a felon in possession of a gun. We will not challenge the second element. The jury should consider it proven, that is, the defendant has had been convicted of a felony before November 5, 2005. The court, as long as I have your comments by 7 Sunday morning, that will be fine. Attorney Strain, we can exchange emails uh, address off the record. The court, okay, anything else this afternoon? Attorney Krauts, we'll probably be submitting ours this afternoon uh, yet, Judge, but if uh, I could just have a moment. Attorney Fallon, Your Honor, there is one other matter that I would, I think the court is aware that I will be submitting a correspondence to the court and Mr. String will respond at some time. Hopefully we can get that done by Sunday, but that uh, may be a tall order as well. But there's one other matter that I, that I will be sending correspondence uh, uh, on the court. I understand, I understand that sometime before Monday morning, I'm going to receive something on that. That's my understanding. Attorney Strain, maybe uh, the jury is coming at, uh, we're starting at 9 with the jury on Monday. The court, yes. Attorney Strain, maybe we ought to be here at 8. The court, I think that would be, well, at least by 8.30. Attorney Krauts, we'll be here at 8.30. That's fine, Judge. The court, okay. Attorney Krauts, that's all. Thank you. The court, all right. We're adjourned for today. Proceedings concluded.